New leaders, some old problems, renewed hope and reason to be proud of our hometown. This year offered plenty, and today we take a look back at our Newsmakers of 2016. Hello everyone, and welcome to this Newsmakers edition of 11 TV Hill. Now to say that it was a news-filled 2016 is an understatement for Michael Phelps being named the greatest Olympian ever, to the historic flash floodings in Ellicott City, to the trials of six officers and the death of Freddie Gray. Our reporters were busy asking some very tough questions and we begin with the trials of those officers. Prosecutors dropped all charges against three of the officers, Garrett Miller, William Porter and Sergeant Alicia White. That was back in late July. Now the decision followed the acquittals of Edward Nero, Van Driver, Caesar Goodson and Lieutenant Brian Rice as well. A judge concluded that prosecution evidence did not support the state's theory that the police officers acted unreasonably and disregarded general orders by not seat belting Gray or getting him medical treatment when he asked for it. As a mother, the decision not to proceed on these trials, on the remaining trials, is agonizing. However, as a chief prosecutor elected by the citizens of Baltimore, I must consider the dismal likelihood of conviction at this point. City State's Attorney Marilyn Mosby charged the six officers following the death of Freddie Gray days after his arrest back in 2015. The case made national headlines, and although it did not lead to any convictions, many say it succeeded in sending a message. Now, the man behind the efforts to not just police, but to forge a new relationship with the community is Baltimore City Police Chief Kevin Davis. Thanks for coming by. Hi, Jason. Good Happy to see holidays. you. Yet again, another newsmaker. We're back around for another year. Fast year. You stay busy. Let's, let's stick with the Gray case for now, and specifically the consent decree. Uh, talk to me about some of the transformations that can be agreed upon here and why you want a, a sure. police uh, officer or someone with law enforcement experience to be the monitor. Well, I, I have a unique experience of living through a consent decree when I was mm -hmm. with the Prince George's County Police Department. So I know what type of pragmatic reforms a consent decree can bring to make a police department better, to make us better in a crime fight, make us better with the community. So 2016, we ended our 14-month investigation with the Department of Justice, sure. and they released their, their findings report. So as we move forward with the negotiations, and we're just four months into the negotiations, we are ahead of schedule with our negotiations. Uh, I'm looking forward to pragmatic reforms that, that make us better, and one of those uh, uh, negotiated pieces is the selection of a monitor and a monitoring team. So it's been my experience and talking with uh, police chiefs across the country that a, a person with significant big city police experience leading that monitoring team is something that bodes well. So far, reasonable negotiations when it comes to things that can change our department. Do you feel like these are things that will, sure. will help the crime issue that we have? Sure. And Jason, we've already made unprecedented right. reform. We've changed the use of force policy for the first time since 2003. We have our administrative hearing boards, our trial boards. We now have them at City Hall. They're open to the public. You know, we've done a lot. Uh, additional training, 21st century training, de-escalation training. So we've, we've done that on our own because it's the right thing to do. So we look forward to, to additional reforms in the future, and, and I'm looking forward to what 2017 has to bring. The most pressing number is a big one, 300. We're dealing with surpassing that number, actually, when it comes to homicides in the city. It's tough to keep track of, but how do you keep the folks safe who are not involved in these kind of crimes? Is that even tougher than stopping the crime itself? Well, we, we just have to keep working really hard. In 2016, we had the trials of the six police officers mm -hmm. involved in the in-custody death of Freddie Gray. We concluded the DOJ. Uh, reform um, the, the uh, consent decree investigation. Uh, we had a mayoral election. Uh, we dedicated over 100,000 man hours of police officers this year just to protests alone. So moving into 2017, uh, we're changing some of our strategies, but we're still going to target violent repeat offenders. Uh, that's the way to go. It's what other big cities are doing across this country. And, and we know who's out there harming our city. We know who's carrying guns. And I'm going to be back in Annapolis this year to make a, another pitch to toughen our, our illegal possession of gun laws because there just aren't the consequences that our citizens expect there to be. Sure, new mayor has uh, decided to keep you on board. Talk to me about the discussions with her when it comes to curbing violence in the city. I know that you know, she's been here since college and so she's seen right, the city right. go up and down. Uh, what's that talk like between the two of you? Well, and I've known Mayor Pugh for, for a number of years, yeah. so it's a very comfortable transition to me. And, and just the other day, uh, the, the mayor put her cabinet on a bus and we toured West Baltimore and we toured Northwest Baltimore and, and I'm in those communities every day. Okay. But it, it was really neat to see the other cabinet heads 
um, looking at, at the problems that just confront our city because I think a government is most effective and, and most efficient when every city agency views public safety as their responsibility. So whether it's housing or transportation, uh, it, it, it doesn't matter. There's something that every city agency can do to help us with public safety, and, and that really seems like something Mayor Pugh is going to concentrate on. Tell me about body cameras. How's that going so far? I know that that period where we started sort of just doing the beta test, I guess, is over. Right. Working out for you so, so far? It, it is. We have over 600 body worn cameras on the street. And the day after Thanksgiving, you know, unfortunately, we had a police involved shooting, but just a couple days after that, we released that body worn camera footage to the community because, you know, we're committed to being transparent. You know, TJ Smith, the chief of our media relations division, his team, is, they've done wonders this year with transparency, but, but we want to put our money where our mouth is. So mm -hmm. when we have that footage that's of significant interest to the community mm -hmm. and it involves something as serious as a police involved shooting, uh, we're going to share it with the community. And you know, I, I was really happy about that. And I'm really happy with where we are with our excessive force complaints and body worn cameras play a role in that. So sure. our excessive force complaints so far this year are down 40%. Our overall internal affairs complaints are down 20%. So body-worn cameras have a role. They bring civility sure. to an interaction between two human beings. We've got about 30 seconds left. I saw yet again another football game between the officers and the community, how they go. And just talk to me about the efforts to, to reconnect, I guess, with a, a right. city. It might have a tough relationship. Well, the, the thing I'm proudest about, and we did lose by one point, oh, one point. But, uh, <laughs> but the quarterback on the community team yeah. is a young man who is now a police applicant. Oh, and and that, that, that's a victory in, in and of itself. So um, we're going to do that each and every year because it brings us together. You know, sports bring, bring human beings together, sure. unlike anything else in life. You, you know that. Sure. And, and we're committed to doing it. And I'm just, I was just so happy to, to have a conversation with that young man afterwards who, who grew up in West Baltimore and is now a police applicant. Yeah. You could have used Justin Tucker this year. We could have you three. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Very you for Jason. coming by, sir. We Thank appreciate you. it. Also, we, we do have to mention that the law enforcement community here in the area also suffered the loss of two sheriff's deputies. I was out in Harper County back in February on the 10th. Deputies Patrick Daly and Mark Logston responded to a call to Panera Bread in Abingdon. They were checking out reports of a suspicious man who turned out to be David Evans. Evans shot and killed Daly as they walked towards that restaurant. 11 minutes later, Deputy Mark Logston exchanged gunfire with Evans, who was in the car at the time. Logston was also killed. Now, investigators found I several guns as well. His intention, um, as it was in 96, to shoot his uh, ex-wife then to take some sort of action against her and maybe other members of that family. Um, and I've said many times since we lost Pat and Mark that, uh, you know, through their loss, lives were saved. And I think that's the lives that were saved. Again, investigators found several guns in Evan's car, along with 2,700 rounds of ammo. They concluded that after years of living under the radar in several different states, Evans had returned to stalk his ex-wife.